Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to another Flutter tutorial video. Today we're going to do something slightly different than we've done before. Because the current Google 2018 I.O. conference is going on, I was watching it earlier today and I saw that they were announcing a lot of cool features in Flutter that I hadn't really noticed before. So I figured that I might as well showcase some of these features for you guys so that you guys will also be aware of them, even if you're not watching the conference. So with Flutter Beta 3, there are a bunch of new layout features. Specifically, we have a new widget, which is a bottom app bar. This allows us to manipulate a bar at the bottom of the screen in a way that's actually pretty intuitive. And this bottom app bar also has support for a notch, for instance. We're able to take the floating action button and actually position it over top of the app bar, and it will then create a semi-circle cut inside of the actual app bar. They've expanded the support for chips. Now, I don't believe I've looked at chip widgets inside of these Flutter tutorials just yet, but chips are just compact elements that allow us to represent attributes, text, entities, or even an action that the user will be able to delete using an on-deleted callback. We'll be looking at the most basic version of a chip in this tutorial, but there are a bunch of other types as well. They've added some new input decorators. Input decorators, for instance, like an underline input decorator, which is the default, and then an input decorator that allows us to put lines that cover the entire box. So this is kind of nice, and it's also in line with the Material 2 spec. The floating action button itself, as I sort of hinted to before, now has a bunch of positional options. So these are pretty cool, and they also open up this idea of creating a floating action button that animates from one of these positions to another one. And we'll take a look at that as well. The slider widget, which I'm not sure if we've looked at thus far, also has a few new features for shapes and color support. Outside of these tangible ideas, Google has now announced that the Flutter framework is essentially ready for production. And this has been accentuated by the fact that Visual Studio Code is now fully supported by the Flutter team. Also, many of the Flutterfire plugins are moving closer and closer towards their 1.0 release candidate status. And Dart 2 has now become officially supported for this specific version of Flutter. So overall, Flutter has become a much more viable production choice with this new beta and with the last few beta iterations. So it's gotten to a point where many companies will probably start considering it more seriously from now on. All right, so now let's start looking at some of these features up close and personal inside of the code. For boilerplate, we've got our basic stateless widget as the root widget for this application. And then below it, we have our stateful widget, which builds out an empty scaffold. Inside of our scaffold, I'm going to create a basic app bar. And then the body I will specify as a center with a container. And then we can now specify the bottom navigation bar property and put our new bottom app bar widget inside of it. And inside of this widget, we can give it a color, we can give it a child, we can manipulate the elevation, and we can tell it whether or not it should have a notch. So currently for our bottom app bar, I'm just making it a shade of green, and then I'm giving it a child of an empty button bar. If we pull up our application inside of our emulator, you can see now we have this little green strip at the bottom of our application. So as opposed to the normal app bar, which sits at the top, we now have this at the bottom. If we want to give it a little bit more relief, we can manipulate the elevation. The default, I believe, is 8.0, and I've set it to 20.0. And if you look closely, you can see a slight shadow there. To really display this bottom app bar widget though, we want to build out some kind of widget inside of it, and this will resize the bottom app bar appropriately to whatever we put inside of it. So here I'm making a button bar, and I'll fill this button bar with icon buttons. 
So you can see here, I have an icon button with an icon of home, and then one with an icon of backspace, one with an icon of info, and then another one with an icon of HTTP. And if we look in our emulator, you can see that now the bottom bar has resized itself so that it can contain all of these buttons. And of course, we can press these buttons because there are actually buttons, even though they don't have any kind of functionality. I don't believe I've talked about the button bar that much inside of this tutorial yet. While we're looking at it, I might as well go over it. So it's fairly useful inside of app bars, especially if you want to have multiple different actions inside of your app bar. So you can add raised buttons, icon buttons, material buttons, and have them all be side by side like you would with a normal row or column. But in this way, it's a little bit more organized. We can also align our button bar by calling the alignment property. And this is just the main axis alignment. It's not the normal alignment property. We can either put it on the right, the left, or the center. And in this case, I've put it in the center so that it looks a little bit nicer. All right, so now that we've taken a look at the bottom app bar, let's take a look at the chip widget. With a normal chip, we can specify an avatar property. And in this case, I'll give it a circular avatar. And the circular avatar can have a background color and then a child inside of it. I'm just putting a small little text widget in it and I'm making it a shade of purple. And then we need to specify the label. And this is the main text element or the main element that defines this chip. So here inside of our body, you can see we now have our chip. So we have our circular avatar and then we've got this sort of rectangular slash circular chip with the actual label inside of it. These chips have a bunch of built-in properties that allow you to delete them and dismiss them from the screen. So they're pretty ideal for data that you want the user to be able to remove and add to the screen. Now if we set this chip up with a key or if we were programmatically creating it from a list of data, we could easily delete it by putting some logic into the on deleted function here. And we can add a delete icon when we have this on deleted function that the user can tap to delete the chip. So here inside of our user interface, you can now see that we have this trash can. Of course, when I click it, nothing will happen. But if you did have the logic to delete this chip, it would remove the chip. And we can even theme the delete icon a certain color. So if we want it to match the color of the circular avatar, we can do that. So I put in a slightly darker purple for the icon. And this sort of makes things a little bit more consistent. Also, just on a side note, with the circular avatar, you can, of course, put images in here. This would allow you to create something that's very similar to what you would see inside of, say, like the Facebook Messenger app. So this is a fairly flexible widget that you can use in many different places in your application. All right, so now let's look at the floating action button properties that were added in beta 3. So we can create a floating action button like we did before. And with the floating action button, like with all buttons inside of Flutter, you're required to define an on pressed function. And then you also want to add a child if you want to put something inside of it. So I just put an icon inside of it. And you can see here, as with all of our other applications, the icon button sits at the bottom right. The new stuff that was added comes from this property here, which is attached to the scaffold, which is called floating action button location. Now we can define a floating action button location and actually change the location of our floating action button. I'm moving it to centered dock. And you can see here that it actually docks with our bottom app bar. So it sits in the center and it opens up this little notch here and it then allows us to sort of make the UI a little bit more seamless. We also have the ability to specify center float, which will make it float above the app bar. So you can see here, it just sits in the center. We can do end docked, which will put it back into the right corner, but it will dock it with our bottom app bar. And then of course we have the default, which is just end float, which puts it in the right and makes it float above our bottom app bar. So with this new floating action button location, we can now create what is essentially a floating action button animator, 
which will animate the button from one location to the next. So for instance, if we wanted to make it so that the button starts at center docked and then changes to maybe the right float location, we could do that. We could make the button spin around and we could do a bunch of other things. We can do this by adding a property to our scaffold, which is called floating action button animator, and then specifying a actual animator. To actually do this, I'm going to set up an animation controller and then an animation that outputs a double. We can set up the ticker provider state mixin for our state class, then add an animation controller to the top of the state class, and then set up the animation controller in our init state class. So here I'm saying controller equals an instantiated animation controller, the duration of which is two seconds, and then the vsync is from this state object. Now down at the bottom of our application, I'm going to create a class called fab, which extends the floating action button animator abstract class. I haven't seen another example of this type of animation, so I'm only kind of guessing as to how you would implement this. I am fairly certain that there is probably a better way to do this, but for now this is the way that I'm going to do it. So this might be a little bit of a weird out of the way method of doing things. Inside of this class we need to override three different methods. And we also want to pass in our animation controller so that we know how we're going to control this animation. So the three different methods that we need to override are the get offset method, the get scale animation method, and then the get rotation animation method. The get offset method changes the offset based on the progress of the animation. So when the animation's progress is at zero, the offset should start at the beginning. And then when the animation's progress is at one, the offset will be at the end one being the end of the progress of the animation itself. For simplicity's sake, I'm just going to make a simple if statement that just says if progress equals 0.0, .0 then we pass back the offset of begin, otherwise we pass back end. For the get scale animation function, we're going to create what's called a train hopping animation. This takes in two double animations and then combines them. This is a fairly basic explanation of this type of animation, but it's something that we may look at later on in more detail. So here I'm defining one tween that starts at 1.0 and ends at negative 1.0, and then I'm specifying that I want to animate with the controller, not the parent here, and I'm doing the same for the second tween. So we could even invert these numbers if we wanted to, so have one of them be negative one, and then the other one be one at the end, and then this would change how the actual animation occurs. Now down for our get rotation animation, I'm just going to pass in a fairly linear animation. So we just start at 1.0, and we end at negative 1.0 and then we animate with our controller again. So now our fab, so now our fab will scale and then it will rotate according to the tweens that we've put inside of these functions. We can now go back up to our scaffold and instantiate our fab inside of the floating action button animator property and then pass in the controller that we defined at the top. And then for the actual floating action button on pressed, what we'll do is we'll call controller.forward to actually start the animation. And then if the controller has completed the animation, we'll just reverse the animation. Now let's open up our emulator. When I click on the fab, it will rotate, shrink down into nothing, and then start to come back up and rotate upwards. So it just kind of rotates down and then rotates up. When we click it the first time, it has a notch, and then when it comes back, the notch is removed. And when we click it the second time, it doesn't have the notch, and when it comes back, the notch gets added again. Now while we're on floating action buttons, let's talk about the floating action button extended type. This allows us to extend our floating action button to something that's larger than just a circle. Instead of having a child, we now have an icon that we specify, and then we have a label which we can specify. So the icon will be the same icon that we had before, and then the label will be a bit of text that will sit on the fab. 
Now in our emulator, you can see that the notch is quite a bit bigger and the button itself is now rectangular. So it looks a bit like our chip up here. Now I'm not going to click on it to animate it because it will probably throw an error. We can change its position, however, so I'll just change it to center floating. And now this looks a little bit more natural. So that we can add more widgets to our body, I'm just going to move our chip into a column. And now let's look at the new text form field decorations. So this applies to both a normal text field and a text form field. I'm just using a text form field in this example. If we load our application, you can see this is what the normal text box looks like. It has a line at the bottom and you can just type into it like this. Now we can add colors to our text box. So you can see here, I can specify that I want it to be filled, which means I want it to have a color on the background. And then I can specify the fill color, which I've specified as blue 50. And you can see here it now has a blue tint to it. And now we can specify the borders directly. So here I can specify the underline input border. This is the default. So if we open it back up in our emulator, you'll see that we just have the line on the bottom. However, if we want to maybe make it so that we have lines that surround the entire box, we can now put in outline input border instead. So you can see this new property allows us to specify how the lines actually look for this widget. And here now I've created two text form fields. One has the outline input border, you can see here, and then the other one has the underline input border, which is the one on the bottom. It adds a bit more customization to how our text forms can look and how our text fields can look in general. And I guarantee that the team will start to add more border types to this widget. All right, guys. Well, I hope this tutorial was able to give you a good sense of where the Flutter framework is headed and what kind of cool features you can look forward to. If you do want to play around with these features, you can go ahead and get the current master version of the Flutter framework. So here's my command line and I can access the Flutter command line tool by typing in Flutter and then I can just say channel master and this will change over to the master branch of the Flutter GitHub. Once I've done that, you'll see it'll say switching to Flutter channel master and it will give you some Git information in most cases because the Flutter CLI is basically just a wrapper around the GitHub tool. And then to upgrade your Flutter, you just call Flutter Upgrade. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike the video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.